Welcome. This week's show with Hazel Blomkamp is sponsored by the Embroiderers Guild of America, a community of stitch-minded people who inspire passion for the needle arts through education and the celebration of its heritage. New things coming up. A virtual lecture that will be March 13 at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. Registration opens at 1 o'clock Eastern Time on February 15, and the topic is Sashiko, a form of Japanese embroidery, and the lecturer will be Jackie Clarkson. You'll also want to check out the upcoming online course, Some Accumulation by Terry Bay, and that's a hardanger course. Registration starts February 3 and ends March 3, and the first lesson will be posted May 5th. And don't forget those lightning rounds. New lightning round registration starts March 1. There are four new classes, A Touch of Fall, which is uh, taught by Jane Ellen Balswhite, and that's white work, and Sestry, taught by Carolyn Standing Webb, that's black work, Desert Strands, taught by Becky Autry, and that's Russian Drawn Thread, check that out, that's a good one, Shimmering Dreams, Mona Hill is the teacher, and Charted Canvas is the uh, technique, and then also, of course, the National Seminar, The Magnificent Stitch, will be in downtown Chicago, September 1 to September 5, hosted by the Great Lakes region. Learn about that and everything else, and please join EGA. You won't regret it. Uh, all at egausa.org. Our second sponsor for this week is Sassy Jack Stitchery, and here is a word from Kim. Sassy Jack Stitchery is happy to be a sponsor of Fiber Talk. We so appreciate all the heart that Gary and team put into their show, and we always look forward to each episode. Thank you, Fiber Talk, for all you do for our needlework world. Sassy Jacks is a vibrant needlework shop located in the mountains of western North Carolina, just north of Asheville. We're in the process of moving our shop to its forever home in a historic folk Victorian on the national listing of historic places just three miles down the road from our current location. While we're moving, you can find us in all our normal online haunts, our website at sassyjackstitchery.com, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We can't wait to open our doors and welcome you into our new old home. It was always the plan to be in this beautiful old house, and we've invested a huge chunk of our hearts into its renovation. Every renovated board, every push-button light switch, every old porch swing has lovingly, mostly, <laughs> been placed there with our own hands. It has a wonderful, warm, welcoming feel about the place already, and your stitchy joy and laughter with friends will really make it home for Sassy Jacks. So look for us online for the next few months, as we'll be filling online and phone orders as per usual, and we'll be looking forward to the spring at the Baird House in Asheville, North Carolina. When the time comes, we'll leave the light on for you, just like your mom did when you were a kid, so you'll know it's time to come home. Now on to the show. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. You're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, all the way from South Africa, Hazel Blomkamp. Hazel, welcome. Hello, Gary. Hello, Beth. And thank you for having me. Well, we're just glad you're, you you made time to do it there, uh, down there in the hot summer sun. So... <laughs> It's a pleasure. I have to tell you, I was flattered when I received your email because we're very much out of the mainstream. And when people ask to interview us, we think, oh, they heard about us. Isn't that nice? <laughs> oh, yeah, heard we've, we've, we've heard about you. Yes. Yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah we've heard about you. <laughs> I hope it's only the good things because yeah. there are a few bad ones, too. Oh, okay. Uh, all I know is good stories. So, um... Oh, I'm I pleased I about that. Bad. No bad. No bad. No, no, no. I, I have a foul mouth sometimes, but we'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> right. I'll get the beeper out then. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so we had, I mean, heard about you. Yeah, of course we've heard about you. Um, it was the, for me, it was when you started doing the uh, cruel embroidery animals that I really took, I mean, I knew of you, but really took notice when you started doing those. Did that put you on a new level of visibility? Do you know, it's very hard to tell because my jump to visibility 
happened for me when I published my, my first book, that was Cruel Twists. And, you know, I'm struggling now to remember exactly when that was. I think it was about 2012, about eight or nine years ago. And that took me to a whole new level of visibility. Um, I mean, to the extent that I had to employ more staff. In, in fact, I, I only had one staff member and very quickly employed more. And, and we were putting out fires and we had to get used to this new level of getting things out and answering emails and that sort of thing. And, and then, of course, it quietened down, published the next book and back to the same story and the next one. And I think um, The Animals was my fourth book. And when you've published a new book and the orders are coming in and it's just day after day of just head down, getting on with it, and you don't really stop and and think about whether your visibility has gone higher or, or, or not. But certainly what I can say is that the animals uh, were very much appreciated. You know, I've certainly had a lot of emails from people who have enjoyed them. And of course, when I'm out and about abroad in other parts of the world, I have a lot of requests for teaching. You know, you make arrangements beforehand as to what you're going to teach. And certainly since that book was published, a lot of those requests are for the animals. So yes, you know, I'm sort of keeping going with animals and birds, even before I got onto the animals, I'd done quite a few birds over, you know, I've been doing this for about 30 years and birds were always popular. But stupidly, I suppose, I was always a little bit scared of animals because to me, it's always the face and you've got to get the face right. And I was always scared of those faces. But of course, I started and they worked out fine and... I've kept on with it. I'm currently doing another book of animal faces. So far, I've got a tiger and a lion and a monkey. But then, of course, the whole COVID thing kicked off and that got put on pause while I taught myself videography and and got myself really au fait with, with online classes. But I will be going back to it in the near future. But normally I've had books two years apart. This is going to be a bit longer. But once again, the animals. But I will admit that the other day I was thinking, I feel like doing flowers again. <laughs> <laughs> so I will get back to, to flowers, you know, more Jacobean, typically Jacobean style, right. I think. I've heard about your pieces because um, my guild – um, they saw Cruel Twists and immediately was like, oh, look at this book, look at this book. And what struck us was that you had these Jacobian designs with the beads and the colors. And we just, we felt, and the techniques you used within them rather than just the flat cruel. How did you move into yes. that? I suppose really it goes back you might say almost to my childhood in the sense that we live in Africa. I was born in Central Africa in, it was Northern Rhodesia then became Zambia. I was born there, grew up on a farm and the attitude and the general feeling growing up was you do what you can. So in other words, if the tractor breaks down, the, the part is going to take whatever, six weeks or six months to, to come from John Deere in the U.S. So you, as they say, bopper it with wire, which is an African, bopper is an African word, word that means basically tie it up with wire. So you grow up with the, the making a plan, making things work, and that becomes a part of your life. And so when it comes to your art, yes, you know what cruel is and you know what the, I'm saying this in inverted commas, what the rules and the guidelines are, but you're too imbued with this, I'm going to do it my way because that's how I've always done it. And so when I started getting interested in 
the cruel or Jacobean style. I didn't want to stitch with wool because, first of all, it's not that e- it's it is possible to get it, but it's not that easy to get here. But also, when you live in a hot climate, you don't really want to be working with wool. Um, just the <laughs> thought of it, you <laughs> just the thought of it makes me feel itchy. So, you know, you you tend to to work with with cotton, which is what you usually work with, and and then of course. As time goes on, you start thinking, well, um, yes, okay, you know, there's buttonhole and trellis carching and all the rest of it. But I have worked out how to use needleless techniques as embroidery stitches. Why can't I fill an area with with needleless instead of, for example, trellis carching? And then at some stage, probably in the last 15 years or so, I got really interested in beadwork, the proper, you know, what they call off-loom weaving techniques. So that introduced beading to my life and, of course, all these wonderful Miyuki beads. And it was somehow a logical pro- progression to to start taking those into my embroidery. So it is the reason why... The, the title of my first book was Cruel Twists because, yes, it's a play on words. Yes, it looks like cruel, but it has a twist to it, you know. So at the end of the day, yes, it, it, it really just pays lip service to cruel embroidery. But it's me at home doing what I want to do. Don't tell me I have to stick to guidelines. I'm having fun is really what it was. Well, see, that's interesting because that suggests to me that you haven't had any uh, formal or semi-formal training that you just really start with a blank slate and just figure out what you want to do. Yes, I, I can't say that I have. I mean, I did – art was one of my best subjects at school. It was the subject that I got the highest mark for in matric, which is our – final school leavers year Um, it was definitely my best subject needlework which I also took I failed and that (laughs) was partly (laughs) it was partly because I was always being told no but you've got to do it this way and and my personality is such that I would say but why it works better (laughs) this way you know so so I failed needlework but I did really well in art. And then when I went on to university, I I did a fairly sort of um, diverse BA degree. And, and I included some fine art subjects in that. So, but I've, I've certainly had no formal training in either embroidery or, or in art. It's just a passion. And most of what I know has come out of books. I'm a big buyer. Well, not anymore, but I used to be a big buyer of books and 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 took a lot from those books. And of course, one takes from the internet. But then as time goes on, you don't need really to take anything from books or internet or the internet because you're thinking up your own things. And and then you're thinking up, I suppose you're inventing things, you know, and including those in your embroidery. So I suppose you could say, yes, I'm not. I just I have a basic artistic ability, but more than anything, I have a passion for it. Yeah. So, so have you shipped a box of your books to the teacher and asked for a grade revision? <laughs> the needlework teacher yes i don't i don't even know if she's still alive or whatever <laughs> but i'm certain that uh, of course uh, that my my name is my married name not my maiden name right. she probably wouldn't even know who it was <laughs> i suspect she'd be very surprised <laughs> <laughs> but it's it sort of goes along with with a lot of what I feel about training and uh, training versus an innate ability. You can go and you can learn and you can be formally trained, but it's not necessarily always a good thing. Sometimes a person that has a 
an instinct or whatever you'd like to call it should perhaps just be left to learn and and part of what what made me come to this view is I have a son who is also artistic, but he's also very technology savvy. And from quite young, he showed an interest in videography and filmmaking. And so being the good parents that we are, we supplied him with all the, you know, the video cameras and the computers and the software. And ultimately, he went off to university and he studied it. And he didn't enjoy it because he had taught himself. And believe me, he was putting out some quite good stuff. He taught himself very well. I think he just had an innate ability to do it. He didn't enjoy his degree. And the day he left university, he said, I'm never going to make another film in my life. Mm. And he's now working in inexplicable technology stuff that I don't understand. Um <laughs> And and that's when I thought about it, not only for him, but for myself and thought, yes, maybe if you are good at something. And of course, along with being good at something, you need to have a passion for it. Maybe you should just be left to get on with it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, who <laughs> yeah. knows, you know. I, I, I think, yeah, I think you're right, because um, I homeschooled my children and we allowed them the opportunity to explore their passions. And I, we were yes. trying to remember where we got my middle child a soldering iron. And I want to say he was about 11 at the time. And he started, he made his own CNC machine in the basement. Okay. So people say, how could you let him do that? I'm like, well, he was interested in doing it. So we just got the stuff he needed you in the way. You just got he on went. with it. Yes. Right. So I, I remember us by my husband and I have always had our own separate computers and my son must have been about 10 he was still very much in what we call primary school um so in about the fifth or sixth year of schooling and we got so tired of sitting down to work on our computers and he changed all the settings or or he picked <laughs> up a virus on the internet or whatever. And one day my husband came home and said, right, now tomorrow, Dominic, Dominic was his assistant. He said, Dominic is picking you up after school and he's taking you to buy your own computer. And of course, my son, my son was absolutely delighted and he got his own computer. And then I had all of my friends saying to me, what a spoiled brat. <laughs> but look where it's taken him. Right. right. You know, right. you have to let them follow their passions. You also need to see that they have the ability to be passionate. And he's the sort of child that will work till four in the morning if needs be, if he's busy on something. And that's what you like to see because that takes them far. Yes. Well, and it's so interesting that a, a computer start out and then he wants to do film, but then he ends back at computing. Um Yes. Yeah. So, yes. The, so that think, thread carried think, all the way through. Yeah. Yes, I think I think part of of the 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 in between um, film thing was my husband, who is well qualified, has a few degrees, and and very much a, a sort of mainstream kind of guy. Was partly my husband saying to him, "You've got to study further. You've got to get a piece of paper, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And who knows? You'll never know. And even hindsight doesn't tell you whether he shouldn't have just been left, you know. Right. Um, but still, he's got that piece of paper. And, and as much as he hated it, he, he learned some stuff, you know. Right, yeah. Right. Hard to right. avoid yeah. that, yeah. Yes, yes. So I suppose we should get back to embroidery. <laughs> yeah, sure. Or, or we could do a whole show about your son. It's okay. Um. <laughs> oh, yes. He's an interesting guy. I won't, I won't tell you what we used to call him as, you know, back to the old potty mouth thing. Um, but nice guy. Grown up, you know, nice, friendly, honest, hardworking, all the things you want. That's all you want for your kids. That's right. right. Well, maybe I'll send him yeah. an email and, and we'll just record a show with him. We'll just see how it goes. <laughs> Might might be a good idea. I'll warn him, and he will he will he will mumble and swear and say, "I the time for this." 
<laughs> you know what mothers and mo- sons are like with their mothers. Mm. <laughs> so was yes. was needle was needlework obviously a hobby when you start? When do you yes. when do you start to transition into making it a business? Because that's you know that's quite a step, a mental step, and not to mention physical and time step. But what what makes you? When did that happen? Do you know? It was a slow transition. I mean, I I fiddled with thread and wool, and I I embroidered, but mostly cross stitch and tapestry, that sort of thing. In in my youth, I was at boarding school, and while all the other jolly hockey sticks types were out playing hockey, I was sit, sitting crocheting. For example, you may or may not remember there was a, a movie called Love Story. Um, Ryan O'Neill and yep. Annie, Ali McGraw. That was when I yeah. was in high school. And Ali McGraw wore a hat, a, a crocheted cap. And those were all of, all the rage. And at that stage, I actually did quite well if, out of just sitting there in the afternoons and crocheting caps while, while everyone else was playing hockey or tennis or, or swimming or whatever they were doing. So it was always there. And, of course, those, for example, I made up my own pattern. It was easy enough to do. And then, you know, as time goes on, that never leaves you. And you continue, you know, as a young married woman, I would make all my own curtains and cushions and even Roman blinds and festoon blinds and and whatever else you like. I even did quite a bit of upholstery. And then this very same son we were talking about just now, when he was about 18 months old, he got very ill with a blood disorder that caused his blood not to clot. And and we were going through, it wasn't hemophilia, it was something else with a very long name. And we were going through a bit of a nightmare of couldn't bump himself, couldn't fall. Couldn't, and you know, at 18 months old, they haven't been walking for long and it, it was a nightmare. And he must have been about six months into this, this terrible disease. And a friend of mine said, I've booked you on an embroidery course. And I said, I can't go. I've, I've got to sit here with this child and watch him every minute that he doesn't cut or fall or or whatever and she said no I'll look after him you need a break go and do this embroidery course which I did and I didn't I I can't remember how much I learnt that was new to me. I was in my early 30s, um, and I don't think too much was new to me, but it turned out to be really just what I needed at the time, a creative endeavour to to help to take my mind off this, but one that I could do with the sick child. And, And honestly, there hasn't been a day since then, unless I'm on one of these overseas joints, at least joints, that I haven't sat and stitched. And and I think anyone who does this sort of thing, and you're the same, I'm sure, as you're stitching the one design, you're enjoying it. You, I'm enjoying the creativity of, you know, what stitch, what color, what thread, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm also thinking of my next design. And and so you go straight on to the next design. Even before I finish the one that I'm on, <laughs> I will have drawn on paper the next design. So then after a while of, of this, I would go into one or two of the local shops to buy thread. And I would often take what I was doing, not, not to show it off, but to match the threads that I thought I might need. And so the shopkeepers would then start saying, oh, wow, this is amazing. Don't you want to teach? And, uh, well, eventually I did. And the moment you start teaching, you think, well, if I'm going to teach, I've got to do it with my own designs. We can't, you know, be infringing other people's copyright. And so you start your own designs, and then obviously you need to put them in kit form. And and so it goes on. And all of a sudden you realize I actually probably need to turn this into a proper business. Or, or alternatively, you have a little thing that happens where um, I was at some evening function with a whole lot of my husband's colleagues, and, and one of them said to, to me, so, so what are you doing these days, Hazel? Your children are getting big. And so I said, well, I'm doing a lot of embroidery. And he went, 
uh, embroidery. Why don't you just get a proper job? <laughs> and so then you think, oh, you know what? He, he, needs, he needs a box of books, too. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, the interesting thing was, oh, I don't know, about five or six years later, we just got back from Russia. My my first book had been translated into Russian and I needed to go over and show my face and we were there. And it's one of the few trips that my husband came with me because he was really interested in seeing Russia. So off we went to Russia and just absolutely loved it and came home and oh, within weeks, I can't remember the time span, there was a similar evening function and the same bloke was saying to me, how was Russia? How was Russia? And I was so tempted to say to him, you know, the only reason I was there in the first place was because of bloody embroidery and I got a proper job. <laughs> you know, I wrote a book. <laughs> so, and, and so, as I say, it was, a, it was a slow transition and you just get to each step or each next step shows itself when you're ready for it, I suppose. You know, my latest one being this whole videography thing, which I've been threatening to do for years. But if I'm honest, I was scared of it. I had bought a camera and all the other stuff oh, about three or four years ago. My son showed me how to do it, went far too fast. I looked at it and I thought, oh, no. I'll, clo I'll lock it up in the cupboard and think about it another day. And then spent about three years feeling guilty because I'd bought all this stuff and I, had, I wasn't using it. But you know what? The right time showed itself. Lockdown yeah. came along and now I'm forced to teach myself how to do it, you know. And, and that's somehow how it's been all the way along. You just go on to the next step and the next I'm getting old though I don't know how many steps are left <laughs> let's see <laughs> sad isn't it no you got lots more life in you lots more time oh I think so unless the COVID gets me but I think it's unlikely I work from home yeah that's a plus <laughs> yep yeah yes yes so that yeah, so you have you have Almost from the beginning, then even you know love story. Yeah, there's one. There's one. One of the probably ten sappy books I ever read. Um. <laughs> I don't think I ever read the story. I must say, but the movie was big when I was about fifteen or sixteen. Yeah, well, it's a quick read. Trust me. There's not. It's not a lot of depth. Yeah, I'm there. sure it is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm usually up for murder and mayhem, not uh, not that stuff. But yeah, you can you can rip through yes. that in a good afternoon without any trouble. Don't worry. Yes, um, yes, me too. I mean, wasn't it from there they got all the soppy stuff of love means never having to say right. you're sorry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that. Yep. <laughs> yes. oh, yeah. 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 That that little, oh, that little book had a lot of impact, but uh, yeah. Yes, it did. Yes. I think mostly because from a female point of view, everyone was swooning over Ryan O'Neill, you know. And of course, it was a big tearjerker. And yeah, we go from there. Personally, at about the same time, I preferred to remember the movie The Sting. Oh, yeah. With all that wonderful Scott Joplin music. Um, that was my first introduction to Scott Joplin and ragtime music. And it's well, just been another of my passions ever since, you know. I love that music, and that was the sting. And that had far more of an impression on me, mm -hmm. lifelong, than Love Story ever did. But but there you go, it featured <laughs> in my life. <laughs> but you, you even from then, crocheting the hat, uh, for you, it's always been create your own? Very, very little Pretty of doing others? So. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much so. Um, and I'm not sure why. I, I suppose I'm quite individualistic. Um, you know, for example, I've never, ever belonged to a guild. Um, I, I'm not a loner. Believe me, I'm not a loner. But, but I just like to be and do and think up my own ideas. And and that's, I, I mean, the very first, or that embroidery course that I was talking about, obviously that was someone else's design. That's the only design that I've done that was someone else's because I just like to do my own thing, you know. I'm lucky I can. 
I'm lucky that I have an innate artistic ability, an ability to draw and an ability to know what to do with that drawing once right. I start and stitching have, it. And you also have a design sense, you know, you have a, an I, you know, um, composition, not just, you know, doodling or, or, or yes. sketching. Yes, yes. I think a sense of balance, a sense of a sense of color. Um, I don't. I don't know that you can teach that. I don't think you can teach, as you say, that innate design thing. I'm not sure that you can teach a color sense either. I think you've either got it or you haven't. I've always been grateful for it, and at the same time, I can tell you that I don't do maths very well. Um, you know, I don't have that. I've got a design. I mean, whenever I send off things, fortunately now the website does it for me. But I always have to say to people, check that invoice. I can't add, even with a calculator. But I can design. And you know what? I know what I prefer. It's given me a lifetime's pleasure. Yeah, well, that yeah, when when you can do when you can have a proper job and enjoy it, there's nothing nothing beats yes. that. <laughs> Yes. And and a lot of people will say, oh, but don't you get tired of it turning your hobby into a job? Doesn't it take the edge or the enjoyment away from it? And I'm going to say, no, it doesn't. There are times when I have to sit at the computer and, for example, sort out lost parcel problems or, yes, I don't enjoy that. But the moment I sit down and either draw or stitch, and more recently, I've even got to the point where I quite enjoy editing the videos. Um, it's I, I enormously enjoy doing all the stitch illustrations, for example, on, on my computer, on, on Illustrator, because even that has its own creativity you know got to get the curve just right and you know there is a design element to that even though you're drawing a specific diagram I suppose rarely it's just an obsession to create yeah that well that and that's Beth and I have been having uh, on on air and off air discussions uh, quite a bit lately about the whole concept and, and approach to creativity and uh, yeah. yes, yesterday we were having a discussion uh, where Beth Beth is is working to be more creative, and I'm I'm not opposed to being more creative, but I I think I wrote to her that that for me I need a set of rules that that, that I master, and then feel like I can branch off of those. And I think if I read now Beth that's right, interesting. Yeah. Sorry, you were well, saying but, I but interrupted. I, but, I, but I think like like you you don't seem to need that. Matter of fact. Rules aren't even part of what you do, and I think uh, if I read Beth right, that it's a lot of, of where she's coming from. I just, for me, yes. it's it's to the other end of the spectrum that starts me. That's interesting because yes, you've got it in a nutshell. Um, you know, I often come across people, particularly embroiderers, who say, "Oh, well, it's all very well breaking the rules, but." You need to know the rules before you can break them. And I disagree with that from my point of view. All I need to know is the techniques. And then I'll do with them what I feel like doing. And possibly, Beth, you're the same. You know, yeah. everyone comes at it from a different place. Right. And, and I think sometimes you, if you, you tend, I, I think sometimes I feel boxed in when I follow all those those little rules and all I want to do is you know I just want to break out of the box a little bit and and, yes. and try something new and I think sometimes um especially as needlework people people are afraid to try those new things and, and even just changing colors you know it's, yes. it's easier just to do it as charted let's be honest sometimes we're, we just want to do it okay I'm just going to do it as it's charted that's fine but if you don't like yes. it then Why time not change them? Right. You know, shortly shortly after my first book, the Cruel Twists book, was published, I was on its Amazon page and I was reading the the reviews, and one of the reviews said, 
I have always wanted to do Jacobean embroidery or cruel embroidery, whatever word she used. But I was told you can only do that with wool and I'm allergic to wool. Now, finally, here's someone telling me I can do it with cotton, words to that effect. And I read that and I thought, that's so sad because of the stranglehold of those that tell you you can only do it one way. And it is, it is a stranglehold in many parts of the world. You you have never tried something that you really wanted to try. I found that very sad. And I'm the first one to say, go for it, do it your way. Something interesting that's happened to me in recent years, you know, the, the, the big long and short stitching, the, the silk shading thing, um, mm-hmm. which, which is most people's nemesis. Now, I do that fairly well. I will tell you that I don't do it as well as Trish Burr, who's also in <laughs> South Africa. And I mean, she's just amazing. Yeah, that's Trish. a high bar there. Um, <laughs> Yes, yes. And part of it is she puts in extra colors and you look at it and you think, I don't know how you do this. It's amazing, but it's beautiful. And I'm not I'm not going to put myself in that category, but I do a fairly good long and short stitch shading. And I was I had been taught originally. And of course, when I taught, I would say to people always come from the top. Start with your thread at the top, go to the bottom, back up to the top, and keep your threads going in the same direction. And about four or five years ago, I was teaching on one of the Inspiration Magazine cruises that went down the Mekong. And part of the deal of, (laughs) I had said to the Inspirations girls, okay, part of the deal is that when the, the boat docks in Saigon and we all get off, us, the management, go up to Harlong Bay. I want to go and see Harlong Bay. So we did that. And we flew up to Hanoi. And the next day, we had about a four-hour land transfer out to Harlong Bay. And the driver stopped at about the halfway point. And we went in. He said, you know, this is where we'd get refreshments. And we went into this enormous, almost warehouse-style building, And in there was, apart from refreshments and artworks for sale and curios and that sort of thing, on the left were all these uh, people well-known that will make you a silk suit in a day. So there were about 30 people there busy at their sewing machines. And on the right were a bunch of young people, also about 30 of them, just sitting doing this beautiful Vietnamese embroidery. And it is exquisite. It's absolutely exquisite. And we stood and watched them, and most of it was being done in silk shading. And they were going backwards and forwards. You know, whereas as I, as I started with this saying, always come from the top. Mm-hmm. I came home, and I thought, well, I'm going to do this. And, and I did. And you know what? It makes no difference to the overall look (laughs) of your shading and actually it's easier because you get your randomness that you need in your long and short more easily because you know where you finished and you come up somewhere else you know so that's as the world and I mean it's happened in our lifetime I'm sure we're sort of I think I'm probably older than you but we're old enough to have seen Everything boxed in, you know, in this country, they do that and that country, they do this and, and that's how it's done and that's how it remains and they put a ring around it and that's what you have to do. But of course, as the world opens up, particularly with the internet, you can sit and browse the internet and you can look at French embroidery and Brazilian embroidery and Vietnamese embroidery, you know, whatever you like. And why would you not want to take ideas from all of those diverse styles and make up your own style, really, and not be boxed in? So I'm going to say to you, Beth, forget those rules. Do what you want to do. You certainly get more satisfaction out of it. I think you're right. I think you're right. (laughs) It's a matter of getting over the fear, too. I think sometimes we're afraid to make those they step out. And I think that comes back to your, you know, you, I hear you keep saying passion, you know, you have a passion for needlework. And, um, 
I think I sometimes I allow the fear overcome my my passion, my love for this this yes. art. Yes, and I'm going to tell you right now that I'll be sitting doing something, stitching something, and I'll do it a certain way, and I'm thinking, oh, not supposed to be doing that, doing it that way. And as vocal as I am about break the rules, do it your own way, I still have those feelings. Not often, but I have them. And, and I think a lot of that comes from your childhood, the way you were taught. I mean, I wasn't exactly taught in a convent with nuns who'd slap your knuckles with a ruler if you if you got it wrong. That but it wasn't that far off it. And so it was it was sort of drummed into you. And and also at home, I mean to this day, I'll sit down and draw a picture. Now bearing in mind that it's my business to draw these pictures. And I will I'll hear my father saying why are you wasting time on those stupid doodles or words to that effect? <laughs> so, you know, as far as he was concerned, I should be doing something like practicing the piano. He wanted me to be a concert pianist. Um, you know, to him, that was more useful. And and so what I'm saying is you you have these these flashbacks to your your childhood, your school years and what have you that stop you from doing it even for someone who's as vocal as I am well and it's it's interesting to me too and I'm, I may be wrong on this but I think that there's an advantage for you and and Trish Burr is, is another example in that you live in a part of the world where there are not a ton of needle workers and yes and you I don't have that you. influence of peers Yes, I agree with you, and and here's a lovely word for you. I call them the panjandrums of the guild. You know the sort of people, and believe me, not everyone's like this, but in every organization, you get a know-it-all, and she gets herself on the committee, <laughs> and she's the loudest who says, you're not allowed to do it that way. I've been to the Royal School of Needlework, and this, you know, as if that's the only way to do it. And I'm not saying they're not fantastic. Of course they are. But they're not the only way, you know. And so you've got these panjandrums jandrums of the guild and we've got them here i mean i won't mention any names but my staff know there is one in south africa that i always call the commissioner of the embroidery police you know <laughs> um so but but we do have less of it we definitely have less of it and we also have um we have a population on the whole not everyone but on the whole that says don't tell me what to do. I'll do it my way. And that that doesn't that involves everything from driving on the road, you take your life in your hands when you drive <laughs> on the road. You know, it's it's absolutely everything. And of course it's rarely come to the fore with all this lockdown and, and what have you. I mean, they haven't managed to control it because this population does what it likes. So there's that influence as well. And I'm happy with that. I think it does give us the freedom to to not feel guilty. I mean, another one who does the most beautiful silk ribbon is Di Fenikirk, also a good friend of mine. Also incredibly creative, makes up her own stuff, you know, um, also not bound by rules. And and once again, it takes takes all of us back to where I say, if it's broken, you borp it with wire. You make a plan to keep going. And it, it, um, it influences your whole life and your art. And I, I think it's okay that. Yes, yes. When you started yeah. Cruel Twist, your first book, take us through that process of doing books because that's really, your other than classes, your primary way of sharing your designs as opposed to one off uh um offers I, it, it, what I used to do I used to do a lot of one off offerings and then I was very lucky I didn't write a book and have to approach publishers Vilsia Metz of Metz Press asked me if I'd write a book because I was writing a few columns for a 
a craft magazine and and obviously she picked up that I could write and she liked my 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 designs and she asked me if I'd write a book and so I said well okay tell me what I have to do so she said well write me a proposal which I did very gingerly because um I didn't really know what I was doing but I got down and I just designed and I wrote and the writing is not enormously creative writing because you're just writing instructions you know do this here do that there go back to point number three etc etc and um I wrote it in well did all the designs and wrote it in less than a year I can't remember the exact time frame but it was less than a year and in those days we didn't have the the pleasure of Dropbox I put it all on a memory stick and I couriered it down to her and she received it, and I sort of put it away in my mind. I've written the book, it's done. I always said I wanted to write a book, now I've done it. And <laughs> no thoughts of another one or anything like that. And a few months later, she came, she had been at the Frankfurt Book Fair. And the day after she got back, filled with flu, as, as you always are after a long haul flight, she phoned me and she said, I just want to tell you that I showed your manuscript to Caroline at Search Press and she is so excited about it and she's bought the rights for, for the UK and the US and, and um, Canada and so on. And I put the phone down and immediately started thinking of my next book. <laughs> There's something about something being well-received that spurs you on, you know. And, of course, since then, I haven't stopped. It's, it has become, um, from doing a whole lot of one-off designs and just selling them on my website and at hobbies fairs and, and things like that, I, I did the switch into mostly writing books with just a few designs, one-offs in between, and obviously contributions to to magazines like Inspirations and, and various others. Um, and then, of course, I've added, gosh, I mean, I've had some years where I've been abroad five times, you know, so I've added all that flying overseas to teach and all the preparation and kit packing and and what have you that that happens before before you go you know so there hasn't been a lot of time for one offs except then of course and I keep going back to this lockdown came and it's you know you employ three staff and yourself and um you've got to keep paying their salaries because you know, you can run a business for years, but it takes you a long time to get a nice mix of staff members. And I've just got a wonderful mix of staff members at the moment, and I don't want to lose them. <laughs> so you need to keep pay. You don't want to retrench anyone. And particularly here in Africa, our, our poor black people, you are providing employment for them, and they depend utterly on the money you pay them. They have nothing if you're not paying them. So you've got to keep those jobs going. Hence the, okay, better think of some online classes. And since then, I've done about four, I think it's about four online class designs. It might even be five. I've just completed another one, which I'm still busy uploading, and I'm not uploading it at the moment so that we've got maximum <laughs> bandwidth for this conversation. Um so those are one-off designs, but they're specifically related to to these online workshops. And um, as you know, I'll be doing one for the the EGA in in April. That's all uploaded and ready to roll. We've just got to get the kits sent out to them. And a oh, nightmare there because we're battling. And I think the whole world is battling to get DMC threads because yes. the French factory keeps closing down. And um, But I think we'll just get in there. I know the distributors are expecting a big shipment this week. So hopefully everything we need is in there. Um, and then, of course, I was due to go out to Canada for their seminar in Vancouver in May and for the Lady Anne Needlecraft Festival in the Lake District in the UK in July. And both of those are now going to be online seminars. And, oh, boy, I'm busy 
recording all the stitches now and making up those lessons. And as I keep saying to everyone, it would just be quicker to fly their teacher and come home <laughs> because right. they take forever. It is. It's, it's a long – I'm doing them properly with proper editing and voiceover and all of that kind of thing. And it's just a long, slow process, you know. But you want to do them properly. Yeah, I, I had yeah. a friend who um, signed up for your, I think your beaded one, and she said uh, she report. I, 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 re- I refrained myself. I regret it, but I did. And she said it was just a lovely class, a lovely um, the oh, way it that's was filmed. And and, and, it's and nice so, to hear that. Yeah, it it. I know how much work it is to edit yes. and to get close ups um, to do for classes, and so it's nice. Yes. Just that quality of class coming but out. But it's it's also nice for me because the difference between teaching in person and teaching it online is, I suppose, a bit like a movie actress as opposed to an on-stage actress, is you don't get the feedback. And so you don't know. You just have to keep going and hoping that you're doing it the right way. I have had a bit of feedback. And so I, I think, I, you know, it seems that I'm on the right track. So it is nice to hear from you that, that this person did enjoy it. Because, once again, it, it at least means that on some level, at least, I'm on the right track. I do try to do it close up. And if my, if my camera doesn't get – I've got a good little GoPro that, that sits on my head in a head strap. It's not comfortable, but it, it works. <laughs> and um, you zoom in, obviously – well, I, I've got a little sort of lap desk, so I bring everything closer to the camera. But in the editing process, I also zoom in to try and get as close and as clear as possible. And then, of course, try and explain as much as I can in the voiceover, but there's always accompanying instructions. So you hope between all of that, they get it, you know? It's what you aim for. Right. Well, that's, you know, the whole teaching thing is is uh, uh, interesting, too, in that if, if you're a teacher and you pay any attention to what's going on while you're teaching, you learn almost as much as, as you teach. Uh, it, it's a much Absolutely. more of a two-way street than people, and uh, but traveling around the world that must be for you quite an education. I mean, obviously you're teaching them how to do what you do, but uh, so many varied approaches and uh, concepts of, of needlework that you must encounter traveling to Canada and Australia uh, must be a real experience for you. Yes, yes, it is. It has been enormously interesting because every country has its own, well, its own style, but even the the thing they most commonly do. So, for example, I picked up in Canada, and I think the same might be for the US, that there's a lot of even, what I call even weave embroidery. So your needle points and your, you know, that kind of thing. There seems to be a lot more even weave embroidery than surface embroidery. Australia is very much more surface embroidery and obviously all those wool blankets and, and that sort of thing. Um, Russia was interesting. Russia, it's it's the style. I think what what really grabbed me about Russia was was so much detail, so full pattern next to stripe, next to check, and add a few beads and you know all of that kind of thing. And it's not just in their embroidery and their beadwork. It's the interiors of their cathedrals and and their cityscapes and everything. All that pattern all put together, and my gosh, it works. And it, I know, interestingly enough, I have some Russian ancestry quite far back. And I landed there, and everything felt so familiar because that's my style of art. There's, there's definitely a genetic <laughs> memory that comes down somehow. And I just, I love that. And I loved, for example, their dolls and their teddy bears all had really whimsical folk fairy type faces um their their design is exquisite it's absolutely exquisite new zealand is another place 
actually not that different from South Africa. And I think it's because they're so far removed. They're at the bottom of the world and they're a bit cut off from everywhere else. And oh gosh, are they creating some beautiful, colorful stuff down there and such nice people as well. Um, but, but you know, the one thing you, yes, you see divergent styles and diverse people, but because you're always going into what you might call the same situation of a group of women of a certain age on the same, with the same passion as you, usually on the same socioeconomic level as you, probably a similar age to you, and oh gosh, do you have so much in common. <laughs> and then you realize, you realize that everyone the whole world over is nice. Countries only get bad reputations because of the 2% that chart the loudest. You've got one. We've got a few. <laughs> you know, and that's what gives... I mean, Russia, for example, is almost the bogeyman of the world. But what nice people. Genuine, warm, you know, all the right kind of things. And I think, I mean, apart from as I say, the, the diversity of embroidery I've seen, and it's inspired me in a lot of ways, and the diversity of people at heart, we're all the same. Same concerns, we care about our children, we care about our husbands, and in my case, I care about my dogs. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Because that's, right. that's my other passion, and if you think of it, they're polar opposites, because my breed of choice is boxers, and they very active and very slobbery and very dirty. <laughs> and then my other passion is embroidery, which is the complete opposite end of the scale, particularly from the dirt point of view. But there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and we're going to run out of time here. And uh, you mentioned your staff and reading the descriptions yes. of each of the people. I just wanted to, to take a couple of minutes and talk about them because I, I just on your website, I got a real sense of, of a true team that enjoys what they do and uh, really pr you know, a lot of pride in the work. And it, it just came through in the yes. descriptions. Yes. You know, as I said to you a little earlier, when the lockdown came, I was so keen to not let go of any of my staff because we have got such a lovely team. And I'll start off with Pat, who only works for me two or three mornings a week. And she's actually, she is an embroiderer, but she's more keen on quilting. Um, she's actually 80 years old and lives in a retirement village. And when she says to her fellow retirees, no, well, I've got to go to work tomorrow, they all say to her, you're still working. You know, why are you still working? <laughs> but she comes, she does all the overlocking of the of the print packs. She's currently making me some lovely books um, with plastic tops out of quilting fabric and binding them and quilting them that I can insert um, that stretch designs when I'm traveling. Um, she winds, we wind a lot of thread onto bobbins, you know, the, the more speciality threads, and she does a lot of that. And most mostly she just comes and she does those sort of things that need to be done. And then Zandili actually started working for me as a second maid. This is Africa. We have lots of domestic help. And um, I think my maid was going on leave over Christmas and I was having a whole lot of people. And I said to Togo, do you have anyone that can help? And Zandili was sent along and turned out to be the sweetest, nicest person. And I knew she didn't have a job under normal circumstances. And so when her period of, of Togo's leave finished, I said to her, would you like to come and work in my studio and I'll teach you how to pack kits and what have you? And if truth be told, I probably didn't need her at that stage, but I, I just felt 
I suppose, compassion. You know, she needed right. a job. And as time has gone on, she's learned the tricks of the trade and she does it. Yeah, she makes the odd mistakes now and then. And then I apologize to a customer saying, it was my Zulu maiden that did that. You know? <laughs> um, but, but she's got a lovely attitude. She's learned all the tricks of the trade. And the most important thing is that she's a passionate dog lover so if I breed a, a litter of box of puppies she's there helping me if I have to supplementary feed them so she <laughs> she's not just involved in the embroidery she you know she's lovely with the dogs and then I did have someone else working for me um just doing because you know all the orders come in on the website and all the the shipping and, and the admin, you might say, happens in the admin of the website. And I had someone working for me doing that, and then she needed to leave um, sort of tomorrow kind of thing. She had family issues that took over. And um, so I did my homework, and I asked around, and I wanted someone who had some computer skills. They didn't need to be great, but enough but also someone who was interested in in what we actually do. And Andrea was found. And once again, what a lovely addition to the to the staff, you know. So so we all have our sort of designated jobs that we do. I call mine product development. And <laughs> Andrea does sort of the admin of the orders and keeps an eye on stock and, you know, if we're running out of threads or beads or whatever. Zandili mostly packs the kits. And then Pat mostly does, as I say, the overlocking of the fabric blocks and the winding of the threads and and currently making these lovely display books for me. But but it's also a situation where if there's a job that needs to be done, we will all pile in and do it, you know. And and look, I'm the sort of I, – I don't like to be called a boss. I don't like to say they work for me. I like to say they work with me. Because that's how any kind of organization needs to run. We work together. But it might not work if they weren't all nice people, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. No, right. Uh, uh, su successful organizations, yeah, that's how it works. You work with each other. Right. You don't, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. You work as a team, I, it sounds. Yes, we do. and And we all take the attitude of, if something needs to be done, whoever is available will do it. Um, you know, for example, the couriers who's at the gate um, to fetch the day's orders. And Zandili usually takes them down. But if Zandili's in the middle of something and Andrea's, I take them down. You know, it's we don't have designated jobs. We just all muck in and we get it done. We don't always get it right, but we try to. Well, it's terrific when that can happen. It really makes uh, it makes it so much fun to work during the day. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. No, we do spend far more time than we ought to drinking coffee. And this morning, Andrea arrived with a a box full of cakes. You know, and there we that go. happens. <laughs> there we and go. And then, and then, of course, the dogs suddenly decide they want to be friends with one of us and jump on our laps. And you know, <laughs> we waste a bit of time, but it's informal but the work gets done. That's And my attitude is it actually doesn't matter when it gets done so long as it gets done. Right. You know, that's all that's actually important. And, of course, that we do it properly. Yep. Well, Hazel, it has been an absolute treat. Thank you so much for making the time for us. It's been a pleasure for me too, both of you, Gary and Beth. I, As I say, I was delighted to have been asked. And who knows, one day when this big hoo-ha is over, I might even get over to your part of the world and we might meet one another face to face. That would be fun. Won't That'd that be, be nice? It would <laughs> be nice, be yes. Yep. But that's that's great. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, and thanks to everybody for listening. Mm -hmm.